discuss when we should use inotropin patients with heart failure. This is the uh, European guidelines, and it stated that we should use inotropes or vasopressors with special consideration. First, it should be short term, and in patients with hypotension, and they define hypotension here empirically as a systolic blood pressure less than 90, and or signs of hypoperfusion. In patients with adequate filling pressure, not in patients with hypovolemia or in patients with low CDD. So it should be short term. In patients with adequate filling pressure, in presence of hypotension and or hyperperfusion. And the same with the American guidelines. But what is hypotension? And what is hypotension? Hypotension is an empirical uh, number taken as a systolic blood pressure as 90 millimeter nerve. However, in heart failure patients, we commonly see patients with low blood pressure, maybe 80, but they are very well perfused, especially when they are using the common standard anti heart failure medications such as a beta blocker and the RAS inhibitor. So, the use of number alone is not adequate to define hypertension. And at the same time, we may see patients with severe hypoperfusion with good blood pressure, systolic blood pressure above 90 because of the intense vasoconstriction. So we rely on hypoperfusion. And how to define hypoperfusion? We have this list that include clinical criteria and laboratory criteria to have a cold, sweet skin, diminished urine output, disturbed mental status, and narrow pulse pressure. At the level of the laboratory, we can have worsening of the renal function, elevations of the transaminases of the liver due to hepatic hyperperfusion, hyponatremia, and of course, increased lactate level. Of course, we will not find a patient fulfilling all these criteria. And sometimes it may be an impending hyperperfusion, and this is our role to define this patient and to start treatment as early as possible. Classically, when we encounter a patient with heart failure, we should classify our patients in hemodynamic terms into one of three categories. Based upon the perfusion and the congestion. If the patient is congested, we call him as a wet. If he is not, he is a dry. If he is well perfused, he is hot. If he is not, he is cold. So we have a warm wet category, and this is the most common type of uh, patients with acute decompensated heart failure. So the patient is having some congestion, maybe rural restlessness or softening, and he is well perfused, and his blood pressure is good. And also we have the cold and wet patients those with hypotension and hypoperfusion, and also with congestion. And we have the minority who have a cold and a dry hemodynamic profile. They are not well perfused and they are not congested. These are a minority and they have worse prognosis. When do you think we are, we will consider the use of inotropes within this uh, category, the three categories? Or wrong with? Cold and wet? Yes. And cold and dry. And we have a schema for this. In patients with wet and cold patients, this is a very common type of acute decompensation of failure patients who is coming with congestion, but with good sign of perfusion. We will see, we will look to, for the blood pressure reading. If it is low, then you can use iron drops or positive pressure. If it is not, we we'll use vasodilators such as uh, nitroglycerin or nitroglycerin. Then we we'll use diuretic to decongest the patient. And the rule here is first to make the patient warm, then to dry him out. The, the other category of patients who came, came with 
high perfusion and dissolved congestion. They are in, in bending perfusion. Majority of these patients have a uh, low intravascular volume. <coughs> so we, we should challenge those patients with volume. We'll start, for example, the line, uh, 300, 500 cc over half an hour with careful observation for sign of congestion. Then, if no elevation of the blood pressure and still we have evidence of high perfusion, we'll start iron source. Any question here? This is very important as a, a, a golden standard classification for the management of patients with acute decompensative heart failure based upon simple clinical criteria. We can classify the patient into one of these three groups. Data from <coughs> real world registry related to the use of inotropes in patients with acute decompensative heart failure tell us that we use it in about 10% of patients. It range between 12% up to 33%. And the paradox here is that the minority of patients admitted with acute decompensated heart failure are a real hypoperfusion or hypotensive state. So there is an overuse of inotrope among patients with acute decompensated heart failure. This was very evident in the European Society of Cardiology Heart Failure Registry that showed that among patients with acute decompensated heart failure, inotropes or vasopressors were used in 12% of patients. However, only 50% 50 of the patients showed evidence of hypoperfusion or hypotension. And the mean blood pressure, systolic blood pressure among those patients was 100, uh, more than 100 millimeter mercury. So there is maybe overuse or maluse of inotropes among patients with acute decompensated heart failure. And this is important, why? Because we have data, consistent data that use of inotropes independently is associated with increased mortality, both inside the hospital and outside the hospital. And it is independently, it cannot be explained by the worse hemodynamic or clinical profile of the patient. So during hospitalization, the use of um, inotrope is associated with increased risk of mortality, and even after discharge from the hospital, it is increased the risk by 40% to have uh, mortality. And this is why the recommendation of the American and the European uh, societies give group uh, class three, it is contraindicated to use inotropes without specific and good indication, that is hypotension and or high perfusion. It caused harm. Now we will uh, give some hints about a specific inotrope. To a question, what is inotropy? How we can define inotropy? Increased contractility. Increased contractility. Okay, and how to define increased contractility? <laughs> what is the pivot of contractility? Is it ejection fraction? No? It is the calcium. It is the calcium. The cycling of the calcium is in the myocardium. When you cycle the calcium efficiently within the myocardium, you will get the inotropic status. So, calcium, you know, uh, plays an important role in the actin myosin uh, styling by binding to the troponin. <coughs> calcium sensitizers. So globally we have catecholamines, we have phosphodiesterase inhibitors, we have we have calcium sensitizers. Okay. I will discuss the most commonly used uh, inotropes and vasopressors in our daily practice. And TDB dubitamine. Okay. Okay. 
طيب الدي فيتامين ايه الكي بتاعته بيشتغل هاو ات اكس ايه البروفايل اوف ريسبتور بوبيوليشن اكتيفيشن ات اكس اون بيتا ريسبتور سترونجلي اند ليس اون الفا ريسبتور اند امان بيتا ريسبتور بتستيميليت بيتا 1 مور ذان بيتا 2 بيتا 1 موجوده فين؟ في الهارت يبقى هو المين اكشن بتاعه على الهارت اي نوت كوبي على الهارت بوزيتيف انتروبيك اكشن على الهارت بيتا 2 موجوده فين؟ في البلاد بيزنس الفانكشن بتاعتها فاز دايليشن يبقى هو هيعمل انتروبي بلس فاز دايليشن ويز ليس فاز كونستريكشن يبقى ات از ا كاردياك اي نوتروب اند فاسكولار دايليتر So it is called inodilator. Inodilator. Based upon this, we can understand the hemodynamic profile of the behavior. For the cardiac output, should increase because it will increase the contractility and decrease the afterload. So the cardiac output will increase. The systemic vascular resistance will decrease. However, can this cause high potential? يعني قلل السيستم الباسكا ريزيستنس هنعمل باز دايليشنز هل ممكن يحصل هاي بوتنشال؟ اكشولي وين وي انكريز ا كارديك اوت بوت ات از انلايكلي تو هاف هاي بوتنشال انليس وي هاف ا هاي بوكولينيك بريشر سو بيفور ذا يوز اوف دو فيتامين وي شود انشور ذات ذا بلاد بريشر از نوت ذيس لو اند ذا بيشنت از اديكوتلي The contractility is too low that it doesn't increase the portion. The contractility is very low. I mean, with the with the ventricle scar, the the increase in contractility would not be proportional to the decrease in the single cell resistance. And if the patient is underfilled, the risk of high potential is high. And in this situation, we should use a vasoconstrictor agent with this limitation. And it decreases the pulmonary capillary blood pressure. How? And what's the relation of the terms? And by stimulation of the beta one, you have a lusitropic action. You improve the diastolic function of the heart, so you improve the filling characteristic. For the pulmonary vascular resistance, it is not a favorable drug for the right side of the heart and the pulmonary circulation. We have other patients. Is not. It doesn't have a favorable hemodynamic action on the pulmonary hemodynamic status. On the heart rate, it is very bad. The vitamin is associated with the risk of sinus tachycardia, tachyarrhythmias, and the atrial fibrillation and the ventricular dysrhythmias. And this may be the cause for increased mortality in patients using iron pulse. It is as a short half life. However, as other iron groups, it has many side effects. First, we have tachyphylaxis. We should not use ionoprope more than, this is the vitamin more than 24 to 48 hours. Second, it causes myocardial injury. So, we can use troponin ionic. And if this myocardial injury is high, we can have myocarditis. And it can cause allergic myocarditis. It can kill myocarditis. This can be seen in patients on long-term use of ionoprope. And the vitamin manifests by hemodynamic deterioration, fever, skin rash. It's a myocardial injury related to the vitamin direct effect of the drug, or is it related to increased oxygen demand? Both, because vitamin increases the release of norepinephrine from the myocytes, and this causes micro infarctions, injuries within the myocytes itself. So it can cause damage to the cell membrane and release of the cytoplasmic troponin, not necessarily damage of the myocytes. This is a mechanism. And in excess uh, uh, work of the heart, it can cause micronecrosis and actual release of the structural troponin to the blood. Also nausea. This is common but forgotten complication in patients on the, the vitamin. Uh, and of course, the use of monoamine uh, series inhibitors. Any question?
Okay, however, using vitamin in many studies is associated with increased risk of mortality. In this study, we use a comparison between nitroglycerin and amylenone and the vitamin uh, used in patients. This was associated with about 50 to 60 percent increased risk of mortality among patients with uh, acutely compensated heart failure. What, what about dopamine? We start with dopamine kit here. أنا شايف إن دم الدوبامين ده دراج يستخدم في اللازمة في أماكن كتيرة جدا. طيب. It is a very flexible molecule. And it has many actions and the majority of this action is unpredictable. On the heart, similar to the vitamin, it is stimulated theta 1 and theta 2. At the kidney and the mesentery, it stimulates adrenergic receptor causing vasodilation. So this is a very good action because it will increase the flow to important vital organs. And by this means, we can think in dopamine as an ionodilator. In large dose, and we do not have a definition for large dose, it will stimulate the alpha receptors and it will cause vasoconstriction. And now it will be a denoconstrictor drug rather than an denodilator drug. The distinction between each of these actions is very clear. We cannot define at which dose we will have each of these actions. Of course, we have this empirical number less than 5, between 5 to 10, more than 10, but this is oversimplification. Okay. When we look to the hemodynamic profile, for the cardiac output, it will increase, but it will decrease the cardiac output as well. When we have a higher dose for causing vasoconstriction. At the systemic vascular resistance, it will decrease, but also it may increase the systemic vascular resistance, and it may be hard of in this situation. The same with the wedge pressure. We cannot predict what we have at each dose. It increases the heart rate, it has a short, uh, short uh, elimination half-life, and uh, because of the vasoconstrictor action, it can cause tissue necrosis uh, uh, at the site of elimination, so, so it should be used with central uh, venous line. Again, dopamine compared with other medications such as the vitamin and the norepinephrine prove to have uh, a worse outcome in patients with heart failure. <coughs> what about the use of dopamine as um, a diuretic agent or to enhance the diuretic? Yeah. What do you think? Renal dose. <laughs> the dopamine renal dose. Renal dose. Do you use it? Stardemo? <coughs> Relation <coughs> Stardemo? Okay. The American guidelines in 2013 gave class 2B, so you may consider the use of dopamine, low dose dopamine, uh, to improve diabetes. However, at the same year, we have the result of the rose acute heart failure trial that tested this hypothesis. Uh, however, we meet patients with acute decompensated heart failure and impaired kidney function, given dopamine, and they followed the impact of the use of uh, dopamine in renal dose on the urine volume, changed the renal function, and sodium excretion, and the change of the weight. Dopamine versus placebo, no difference. And dopamine is associated with increased risk of tachycardia and dysrhythmus. So this class 2P was based upon, I think, level of evidence P, and now we have more uh, good evidence to ignore the use of dopamine as a renal uh, drug in our patients. Levofed or norepinephrine. This is a very good drug. It is the drug we want in our cardiac patients. 
It has a very good beta-1 receptor, so it is a very good inotropic agent. It has a very good vasoconstrictive action to improve the perfusion without effect on the heart rate. Without effect on the heart rate. So it increases the cardiac output, it increases the systemic vascular resistance in patients with hypotension and hypoperfusion. It has no impact in the weight pressure. It doesn't have an impact on the heart rate. Why? Actually, it may cause bradycardia because the vasoconstriction induced the reflex bradycardia. Short half life, however, when it is used in higher concentration, it may cause the renal and hepatic failure. And now we have a randomized trial published in the New England Journal of Medicine that tested the use of norepinephrine among patients coming with shock. Uh, they recruited about uh, 100, uh, uh, 1,500 patients with shock. 60% has septic shock, and only 17% has cardiogenic shock. So the results of this trial is not, cannot be generalized on cardiac patients. When they compared dopamine versus norepinephrine, they didn't find difference in the 20-day outcome. However, in subgroup analysis, when they looked in the subgroup of patients with cardiogenic shock, they would decrease risk of event among the first months in patients using Lilofert compared to patients with dopamine. And this is why we have now a recommendation to use in blood pressure, nor epinephrine preferable over dopamine. May be considered if there is no uh, need to maintain the self pressure in the presence of persistent heart attack. After fluid challenge in patients with cardiac and now we have number between uh, more than 200 ringer lactate or saline given over half an hour. Epinephrine. Limited use only in patients with post-operative uh, uh, need for support or post-arrest. And it is a pure uh, beta receptor uh, ag uh, agonist, beta 1 and beta 2, to increase the contractility. But what its impact on the blood pressure? If it is given in smaller dose, it is an ionodagic, similar to the vitamin. If it is given in a larger dose, it is Ionoconstrictive. Only limited use, only after resuscitation and post operative patients. Merinone this is our drug. Okay. This is an intelligent drug because uh, it bypasses the uh, adrenergic receptor population and acts on the cycle 10 D by inhibiting the phosphodiesterase enzyme, which is responsible for the breakdown of cyclic MP. So it does not increase the microduction demand? This is an action. It's a, it's a better utilization of the already present cyclic MP. Yes, but also by its vasodilatory action. On the heart, it has an enotropic effect and lucitropic effect. It improves the diastolic function, and it is a potent Arterial vasodilator, <coughs> coronary vasodilator, mesenteric vasodilator, renal vasodilator. Also, it has a venous vasodilatory action, so it decreases the preload on the heart, and it has a very favorable impact on the pulmonary circulation. So, it is one of the drugs that can be used in patients with right side heart failure or who have some trouble in their lungs. So it will increase the cardiac output, and importantly, it will decrease the systemic vascular resistance, and it will decrease the pulmonary capillary load pressure by the vasodilatory effect that decrease the afterload, the preload, and the lucitropic effect. However, this is a tender Achilles of our drug. It decreases the heart rate and decreases the risk of dysrhythmias because cyclic MV is a mediator for dysrhythmias. An important point to discuss here is the elimination of life of merinone. Merinone is eliminated by the liver after about three hours. 
However, its physiological action within the circulation will be there for up to 12 hours after discontinuation of the merinone. And this is important. When we discontinue merinone for a patient in our CCU, do not discharge him and do not transfer him to a, a, a room earlier. Keep him in the ICU till the elimination half life of the merinone is uh, more than uh, is uh, out, then we can judge the hemodynamic profile without the support of the merinone. A side effect, you know, is the elevation of the transaminase of the insulin. So the typical patients for the use of Merinone is a patient who is acutely compensated with heart failure with uh, hypoperfusion without hypotension. Without hypotension. And if there is a hypotension, we will use a vasoconstrictor drug with uh, levofed or small dose of amine. And those patients with overconversion. Usually we use it with vasoconstrictor drug. It is a very favorable drug in patients with right ventricular dysfunction and those with pulmonary hypertension. And we talked about specific proportions for weaning of melanone in those patients. Again, melanone is associated with worse health. It is not a, a unique drug. كان طلع الكونسيبت كده زمان ان هم يعملوا حاجه اسمها اي تروب هوليدايز يجيبوا العيانين من بيوتهم اللي هم عندهم هارت فيلير وهم لسه ما عندهمش دي كومبنسيشن يدوا لهم شويه مارينون في المستشفى او في او بيشن كلينيك ويروحوه على اساس ان دي هتحسن الاوت كام. الاستادي دي عملت القصه اللي انا بقولها وبينت ان مارينون واز اسوشيتد ويز انكريز مورتاليتي سبيشالي ان بيشنتس ويز اسكيميك هارت ديزيز. واي؟ بيكوز ات از this rhythmic drug. So we should use it very cautiously in patients with ischemic heart disease. Then to the calcium sensitizer, and then the lucin and then, this is the drug of common use. How the lapsic immediate calcium is موجودة, it has an efficiency with binding the troponin C, which will allow the sliding of actin over IC, من غير the side effects that and the stimulation of the adrenergic receptor. It sensitizes uh, the calcium, so we have enhancement of the systolic and the diastolic function. It improves the release and the uptake of calcium into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So it enhances the contractility and the relaxation of the myocardium. Also, it acts on an ATP channel, potassium channel, in the mitochondria called the ATP potassium channel. Its presence in the renal and the coronary and the mesenteric circulation. So it is a vasodilator drug. This potassium channel mediates vasodilation. And it also it improves the coronary, it, it, it improves the preconditioning, it the, the preconditioning. It improves the tolerance of the myocardium to the skin. The hemodynamic profile of hemodynamic then, of course, it will increase the cardiac output. It will decrease the systemic vascular resistance, so it is an ionodilator. It will decrease the congestion, the weight of pressure, and it will decrease the pulmonary vascular resistance. So it is another good drug for patients with right ventricular dysfunction. However, it will increase the heart rate, but slightly, and it will cause some dysrhythmias because it will enhance the response of calcium, and the calcium is not uh, a, a neutral um, ion for the channels. We have calcium channel, and we have cyclic EMB that is affected by the calcium as well, by feedback mechanism. And it has a very long physiological action. Levosimin then by itself, the half-life is one hour. However, it has a metabolite with a half-life up to 80 hours. And this is why we just give one 
uh, calls, and based upon this, we can have a support for three and four days. And at the level of my cabinet, this can be maintained up to 10 days, between one week to 10 days. We have a support with a single uh, polis of two semesters. Uh, in a meta-analysis that compared Gibson-Mendan to Ibitamine, Gibson-Mendan showed uh, favorable impact on mortality. Whether this is mediated by increased risk of Ibitamine uh, or a true favorable impact of Gibson-Mendan, this cannot be judged. And it was estimated that we should treat five patients with a cardiogenic shock to save, to have a favorable uh, event in one patient in terms of short-term mortality, mortality within the hospital. And this is why now we have uh, a recommendation for the use of Gibson and Dan in specific situation. These are patients who were already in beta blockers. And now they develop acute decompensated heart failure and we want some inotropic support. Because we cannot use dopamine, we cannot use the vitamin because the receptors are blocked. We can use merlinone or we can use levosimendan. Uh, the technique we uh, use of different inotrope in different situations. In patients with chronic beta blocker use, we will use levosimendan and merlinone. Agreed? In patients with cardiorenal syndrome, what do you think? Dopamine? At least it is neutral. Leucine and then, it will increase the renal blood flow based upon its action on the potassium ATP channels. The vitamin will be because it will increase the uh, renal blood flow. But we should not use merlinone in patients with impaired kidney function, structural kidney disease, because it, it depends upon hepatic and also renal uh, eliminations. And the same for levosimendan. So in patients with intrinsic, intrinsic, not functional, renal disease, we should uh, have a concern related to the use of levosimendan and merion. In patients with ischemic heart disease, levosimendan, okay? It induces coronary vasodilation and it has a preconditioning action in the heart and it is inodilator, D-vitamine, but not merino because it is associated with increased mortality and increased risk of distress. What is septic heart failure? In patients with sepsis, we have depressed myocardial function and they may be a form of myopathy, transient acute myopathy, called septic cardiomyopathy. In those patients, the drug of choice is the vitamin and also the levosimendan. And after, this, after uh, fluid resuscitation for the sepsis and vasodilation, and the use of vasoconstrictive agent, which is the, the drug of choice here is levosimendan. Uh, in, in patients with hepatic dysfunction, not disease. If we have heart failure, we have uh, no heart failure, we have no two form of hepatic dysfunction. Form at the level of uh, a hepatic uh, uh, failure function manifested by cholestasis and then increase the pelugum. We have no attain related to hepatic perfusion that will manifest the increase the transaminase. That we have two forms of hepatic dysfunction in patients with heart failure, not intrinsic chronic liver disease. In patients with hepatic dysfunction, whether related to or manifested by increased transaminase or increased bilirubin, the drug of choice is levosimendan. And levosimendan proved to have a specifically uh, good, fun, good favorable impact on the failure situation. So it enhances the elimination of um, uh, files, a uh, pelirubin uh, in its uh,
However, in patients with liver disease, intrinsic liver disease, liver cirrhosis, lipus and then it's contrained. Okay. Okay, so, so recommending to use the lipus and then in any patient? In any patients? Yes, in any patients. In any patients. <laughs> because it is there. And <laughs> Oh, that's a uh, sorry, I'm a strong suggestion. <laughs> okay, we have some rules. Uh, and I'll start to slide this. Uh, some rules for the use of iron probes. The first rule this is a summary or briefing. The first, we will use iron probes only in patients with hypertension and or hyperperfusion with adequate filling, with adequate filling, with adequate filling. Mm -hmm. If you use inotropin in patients with hypovolemia, it will cause harm. This is a problem. This is the first rule. We should initiate inotropes as early as possible. When we find impending evidence of hypoperfusion or urea or starting elevation of the lactate, we should start inotrope as early as possible and using a low dose as possible. And for the shortest duration as possible. And we should use a combination, such as vasoconstrictor with an inodilate, levosimendan plus levofed, levitamine plus levofed. And for a shorter duration, and we should consider inotrope as what is called as until therapy. We prescribe an uh, inotrope until, until what? Until the patient is well perfused by revascularization, for example, or adequately diuresed, or recovered from insults such as sepsis, or having transplantation, or even till death. But we should have an endpoint. We should not prescribe inotrope endlessly. We should prescribe inotropes with a very specific target or destination. And of course, we should select our agents very carefully. When we consider weaning, we should first consider that the patient is adequately filling. And for the use of dopamine, this is a, a, an important note. When we have dopamine, we will discontinue it at the level of 2 or 3 mic, not at the level of 1 mic or 0.5 mic. Why? Because at this level, we have a profuse vasodilatory action, and we may have a drop in the blood pressure. So if we have a 10 mic dose, We'll start weaning till three mics, then we will discontinue. And for merely known, we'll keep eye while the patient in our room for 48 hours. Then we have a three half elimination, three half life elimination. And during weaning, you should start some medications. We may start the hydroxyl. It will be Okay. We can start nitrates to decrease the period and to uh, decrease the afterload. And we should discontinue uh, uh, some drugs such as the beta blocker or the uh, rust blocker in order to avoid hypotension during this critical period of uh, management of our patients. If we fail weaning our patient from inotrope, we should consider one of three scenarios. Whether this is a cardiorenal syndrome, if the creatinine is rising, this is a very good predictor that we will fail weaning. The right ventricular function, the forgotten chamber, this is a, a, a dysfunction of the right ventricle, is another good cause for failure of weaning from the inotrope. Or whether this is a, a terminal case, and we should think in a mechanical uh, solution for this hypotension or hypotension.
Okay, this concludes my presentation. Okay. I started start using Lipsum and for all patients. Yeah, well, it was uh, in absence of head to head comparison, and the uh, strong indication to use one agent compared to other. However, we, sh we should consider many factors the patients, the disease, the hemodynamic profile, the availability. Levosimentan is a very expensive drug. And it has a hepatic, <coughs> it has a hepatic elimination the uh, demand points. It has a long half-life. The people who have intrinsic liver, liver disease, uh, we, should, uh, we should not consider melanoma as a drug of first choice. We can use it, but it is not the first drug. هما على الهيموديناميك بروفايل بوز ار اينو دايليتوس لكن السايد افكت بتاعت الميرينون از هاير على الليفل بتاعت التاكيكارديا والاريزميس الامباكت بتاعه على الرينال الليبوسيمندان سبيتر الامباكت بتاعه على الاسكيميا الميرينون از هازاردس الليبوسيمندان از فيفربل البروتكشن اجينست اسكيميا الليبوسيمندان سبيتر ف Lipozymin then by uh, criteria looks better than Merino. Like on, on the patient, uh, actual patients, every patient has its own profile. Lipozymin then you give only including Lipozymin meat? No, I said, we have the Lipozymin then and you take the polis and you will be able to get the 24 hours of your life. The action is going to be able to get the up to 10 days. ما هو العيان اللي هيحتاج سبورت اكتر من 10 ايام بعينه تروكس او محتاج سبورت تاني بقى يعني ميكانيكال سبورت او سامسونج ايلز احنا قلنا از شورت از بوسيبل I don't have any experience. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just thinking because uh, we can ask uh, our expert. <laughs> it's a very common about Lipsin Dan, especially in that patient, since we are not able to predict the vasodilatory effect of the Lipsin Dan itself. Sometimes when you just get it without any arterial line inside, you have severe hypertension, you could not uh, just make with them. Especially in cardiorena patients, so I was asking about since in in very little experience with leaves and then without arterial poa, uh, arterial line in the inside, and the use of sadly liver uh, uh, noradrenaline with the leaves and then. Because despite if we have renal affection, the only protection we have against the CV to have the clear C vasodilatation with leaves and then is the noradrenaline. Yes. That's why that would be, I was a little bit skeptical about having the cardiorena patient using leaves and then without the northern no in patients with cardiorenal syndrome should you use legacy then alone or not okay actually rarely we use legacy then alone especially in patients with those those patients with impaired kidney function or hypotension usually we use some iron constrictor drug and usually it is levofed in, in, uh, I mean that, okay, but you have the patient cardiac problem, okay, there is hypertensive, we use noradrenaline, it's not responding, and the cardiac function is there, so we add lipsin then in this way. Uh, as uh, a third drug? A second drug. Use levofed? Yeah. 
and you, you want another inotrop, Dibusimindan will be a very good choice in these patients. Not, not dopamine, and maybe Dubitrex is a good drug, but Dibusimindan have a favorable uh, feature. I, I, I think that Hollywood is a little bit of a drug that is not the same drug. Dibusimindan is not the same drug that is not the same دائما ليبوسيمندان هيستخدم معاه سام فورم اوف باس كونستريكتور ميديكيشنز والهو غالبا ان انا بحتاج تو دراجز كومبينيشن سيرب يعني كان باريس سيمبلر تو واتس يوز ان يو نو يوزولي جيف مارينون ويذ ذا باك جراوند اوف سام مام سمول كويستشن اباوت ذا مينينج فروم دراجز ذا يو كان سي ذا ستوبينج بيت لوك ويتش از سبورتنج تو ستوب بات ذير ار سيمبلر تشيز The sensitization is already cardiac patient, and he has already he has is recovering from a shock. This is improving, but I think that okay, he is already in the room and uh, it's dilating the uh, and we are for the noradrenaline and they are dilating dilated the preload and the afterload. But once we stop the noradrenaline and we continue watching him, watching him over the next two days, I think that we need some dilatory uh, at this point. The idea uh, of avoiding the vasodilatory drugs during weaning is to avoid the hypotension or the hypoperfusion. The use of RAS inhibitor uh, increases the risk of hypotension and increases the risk of renal dysfunction as well. This is a point. The second point, RAS inhibitors are good drug for long-term outcome in patients with heart failure. So depriving the patient from the benefit of RAS inhibitor during the acute stage is not uh, this concerning. The opposite to the beta blocker. Beta blocker discontinuation during acute decompensate heart failure is known to be associated with increased risk of mortality. And we should resist the temptation to stop beta blocker in patients with acute decompensate heart failure. However, in some situations, and this situation mandates the use of inotropes such as hypotension and hypoperfusion, it is indicated to stop beta blocker to discontinue. So once we have an indication to start inotrope, by this indication, we have an indication to discontinue the beta blocker. Yes. I'm very happy to have you here. I hope, inshallah, that in the next visit, we can have a discussion on some of the topics. I have some of the topics. I hope I will know you. لو في مواضيع محببة أو مفضلة أو فيها كونتروفيرشي إن إحنا نقدر ندسكس وممكن نعملها على أكثر من طول إن نعمل سام أرنجمنت إحنا وبعض الكوليكس إن إحنا ندسكس سام فاسيتس أو سام إمبورتنت كونتروفيرشال براكتيكال إيشوز إنتوا تقترحوه فممكن نتواصل ونتكلم مع بعض الحاجات بشكل ده أنا بشكركم وأبدأ